Hi, Dr. Stack. How are you today? I'm doing great. How long have you been an atheist? Mm. Um, it's the process started for me in in 2001, pretty much, and really started to kick off a little bit more in earnest um, around 9/11. It was a very long process. I really didn't become an atheist fully until let's say 2005, maybe. Um, so it was a, it was a good four five year process, and along the way I became a Roman Catholic, which is complicated. Um, but so I would say anywhere between 20 years and 15 years, okay. I've been an atheist. Mm -hmm. If he is, if the atheism wasn't an option in this world, what philosophy or you will follow religion, you will follow instead if the atheism was an option. So if is, is atheism not an option because God obviously exists in the same way that the sun obviously exists? If he wasn't an option like there were atheism if the atheism doesn't exist it wasn't an option at all it just it did never occurred to anybody it never occurred to anybody it wasn't no even mm. something thought uh, no even an option what would be a philosophy of religion that you will follow <coughs> well probably buddhism i mean buddhism is is it's depending on the variety of the buddhism it's practically atheist um so i might end up there uh, I know of people who have ended up in uh, Taoism, or have have spent time in Taoism before moving on to atheism, and, and that might be something. I know that Stoicism has enjoyed a bit of a resurgence in the recent years, and uh, I think Stoicism has a lot going for it. Um, there's also something to be said for uh, Zoroastrianism, uh, you know. So Zoroastrianism is a minority religion at this point, um, but it's a it's it's the sort of foundational Persian faith. It is one of the most innovative innovative religious uh, traditions in the world. Uh, it's pretty fair to say, I think, that Judaism wouldn't be Judaism now if it weren't for Zoroastrianism, uh, and Christianity certainly wouldn't be Christianity without Zoroastrianism, and and. Muslim uh, Islam as a uh, as a function of both of those previous faiths also has a lot uh, of, of debt to pay to Zoroastrianism, and it's uh, it's a very um, exactly a, not exactly a simple faith, um, but it crystallizes the human experience in such a way that it makes things very easy to understand, and so if I had to pick a a kind of a theistic faith, uh, I could certainly do worse than Zoroastrianism. What will be your life philosophy? My life philosophy? I, I would like to think that I would end up pretty much as I have with uh, humanism as a life philosophy. I think most of the best of the world religions uh, are at their best when they are expressing a form of humanism um, and and for myself uh, I can I can sort of distill that away and say well look if, if the best of all these religions has to offer is essentially humanism right the idea that uh, human life is valuable in and of itself right as, a, as an end to itself uh, and that it is a morally good thing to help human beings achieve happiness and to uh and to thrive in their lives and to avoid suffering um and that's essentially humanism then then secular humanism which is the primary philosophy of, of most atheists is essentially that with all the god stuff sort of burned away and so that's probably where i would end up are you grow christian i did i grew up uh, evangelical Christian, uh, some would describe it as fundamentalist Christian. The particular theology that my family uh, believed in was called uh, Calvinism. Uh, although they wouldn't have called it Calvinist, they would have called it Reformed theology, or uh, they would have said, well, we believe in the doctrines of grace. 
Um, the, the first church that I was a member of that I was born into was a Reformed Baptist church. It was pastored by Tom Wells in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, that church, it was originally called just Reformed Baptist Church, and now it's moved out to Westchester, Ohio, and it's called the King's Chapel. And um, anyway, I, I, I spent time in other churches as well, mostly Presbyterian churches, because that was pretty close to Calvinist um, for us. And then I eventually became a Roman Catholic. As a ex-Christian, ex-Catholic, what will be something that you find useful that you're still taking with you from that time when you was a believer? Hmm. Well, you know, the thing that I have carried forward um, from the time that I was a believer was a strong appreciation for and belief in the value of the truth, right? And so when I was a believer, the, the, the thing that under, underlied um, or underlay my, my own personal motivations, like why, because I would go to church, you know, and I would pay attention during the sermons, and I would read the Bible, you know, when they were, when they were up there giving announcements about, you know, like the Wednesday night potluck or whatever. I'd be reading the Bible, you know, reading ahead and trying to see if there's anything in there that I could uh, glean or understand. And, um, and I did that because my understanding was, and because I was raised this way, my understanding was that the Bible is the word of God. And that he has communicated these things to us in this book because he wants us to know about himself and the nature of reality and the source of truth. And the idea of discerning truth was so valuable to me because that is, that is really the source of power, right? If, if you can understand what is true, if you can distinguish between truth and falsehood, then that gives you power uh, to do whatever you want in the world. There's a there's kind of an old trope in old folklore stories about magical beings, and that the um, the way to control a magical being is to come to learn its true name, right? And if you can if you can learn the true name, let's say of the genie or whatever, um, then you can control it. And the thought behind that was that there is some underlying truth to the nature of that entity that is, that is represented by its true name. Um, but, you know, the, the, the name, that's just a symbol, right? So the, be, be, being able to access the true name of the magical entity, of the genie or whatever, um, is not really the thing. The thing that you're doing by that is you're grasping the true nature of that thing. And if you can grasp the true nature of anything, then you can understand it. And you can potentially control it. You can use it. You can avoid being hurt by it. You can uh, help others avoid, avoid being hurt by it. Or you can help others harness the power of the thing, whatever it is, whether we're talking about genies, whether we're talking about agriculture, whether we're talking about nuclear physics. That is the power of truth. And that is what motivated me primarily as a believer. And I was excited about being a believer because I believed that following that particular religious tradition was the route to truth. And that aspect of me has never changed. I still am a dogged pursuer of truth. It's just that I realized, I came to realize that, well, this religious tradition is an imperfect guide to truth. Uh, and in, in many cases, it may be not just an imperfect guide, it may be a false guide, a false prophet of truth. And learning how to distinguish between the false prophets 
and the good sources, the reliable sources, and being able to, to look at the pastor who you're, you're sort of, you're born and you're bred, whether it's the pastor, whether it's the priest, whether it's the imam or the rabbi, you're born and bred to give these people the benefit of the doubt and say, well, these people would not have the positions that they have if they were not the arbiters of truth, so I should listen to them. And certainly, as a general rule, for people like that who have studied and thought deeply about these things, right? That we, we hope that people in those positions will have done these things, that they will have studied, that they will have thought, that they have explored the depths of their own consciousness, that they have um, studied the history of their own traditions and really tried to weed out the good from the bad. At least I hope that. But we also know that that isn't always the case. There are uh, pastors and priests and imams and rabbis who do that, and there are plenty that don't. And realizing that distinguishing between the good ones and the bad ones is my job, right? As a believer, my job is not just to merely believe. My job is to listen and think and discern. And if the pastor up there is saying something which is wrong, to say that it's wrong. And if all the elders in the church are backing up that pastor and saying, no, he's right. But I've listened to them all and I've read for myself and I've thought about it and I tried to discern for myself. Then I can say to them all, no, you are all wrong. And if everybody in the church stands up against me and says, you are wrong. You don't understand this. You just have to listen and go along with us then it still is incumbent upon me to stand and plant myself like a tree in front of the entire congregation and say, no, you are wrong and you can go to hell. And finding yourself in that position, I think is, uh, it's not necessarily something that you seek out, but it is a duty that everyone has to accept for themselves that if it comes to that point if you find yourself surrounded by false prophets if you find yourself surrounded by people that are buying into bullshit then you are far more than than uh giving your assent to some book or to some tradition or some institution and magisterium that exist that has existed for centuries upon centuries if there is a God, if there is a creator of the universe who has created truth as reflected by reality, if that God is worthy of worship, then that God will surely reward anyone who takes a stand for truth. You never uh, thought or it never crossed your mind about a dimension out of this life that is not visible to our eyes or is not we can perceive with our cognitive skills that we currently have never cross your mind um not really i mean it's a, it's it's a kind of an interesting idea that there would be like some other dimension or some other plane of existence that you could you could live in uh but you know ex explain if, if there is if there is some sort of a higher dimension fifth dimension, sixth dimension, whatever, you know, I don't have really any good understanding of theoretical physics. There may be, the last I was in touch with it at all, there was something like possibly 13 dimensions that were all sort of wrapped up and, you know, spun around each other. I can't conceive of that. In the same way that you can't, you can't conceive uh, a one-dimensional dot about the existence of a sphere, right? You're just, you're not in the same conceptual space. So if there is some higher plane of existence, different plane of existence, um, I can't conceive of that now. And so, yeah, there's, un unless there's some way of, of wrapping my brain around it and sort of getting in touch with what that might be, I mean, that would be interesting, I suppose, if I could 
uh, you know, have a have some sort of an an, an imaginative, or imaginative. You know, uh, maybe there's a certain species of mushroom that I could ingest that would lead me to that place. I don't know, um, but as of now, I, I I just can't conceive of it. I'm not closed off to it. You know, but there are stranger things in in uh, your philosophy. Um, so it's possible. What do you think it happens? Is a dimension when people life is something there after? What do you think happened with humans after the body death? So the flippant answer is the same thing that happens to them before they're born, right? Which is to say, nobody knows, but it's 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 non-existence, right? And so if if non-existence is the state of every person for infinite number of years or infinite minus one minus number of years um, before they're they're born and they come into existence and that is the same state of being that they return to after death and so if if the non-existence prior to life is a comfortable situation that does not distress me to think about then the same should be true for afterwards what what concerns me more about the uh, more about uh, my my life, um, as opposed to the idea of an afterlife, is once I am dead and gone, what is what is the legacy that I've left behind? Right. So what have I done with my life uh, that will live on? That will have an impact on other people? Have I made things better for not just myself but for other people? Have I? taught any have i taught myself anything have i managed to teach anybody else anything um have i helped people to realize things about themselves that they might not have realized otherwise if i've been able to raise my own consciousness maybe i can bring some other people along for the ride what will be your message and reasons to future people that are considering became an atheist what will be a good reason why i should be an atheist why i should be hmm. Uh, free thinker, why I should be a humanist, why I should be agnostic, why I should be abandon religion and pursue that through that you're mentioning? Well, you know, it just kind of following up for what I just said. Um, if you value truth, right? If you value truth and you find yourself in a position where the people around you are not representing truth and you know that they're not representing truth you know that they're re they're re representing their own interests they're they're participating in a system that that supports them supports what they want to believe supports what they were brought up to believe um if you find yourself in that position and you value truth the same way that i did then i would say that the only reasonable thing to do is exactly what i did and apost apostatize um that being said um, apostasy isn't necessarily something for everyone. Um, there are people that I have known that are really and truly better served by simple belief and, and acquiescence to a religious power structure. There are people like that. And I, I think we all know that there are people like that. Uh, that doesn't make me happy. I don't think that that's necessarily the best possible world that we could live in where the people like that um, give themselves over to religions. Um, and I, I certainly wouldn't recommend it as a blanket rule, but there are some people that I know that I have known who are like that. Um, I mean, the, the only real thing that I have to recommend atheism is that it's true. There is no God. <laughs> or if there is a God, uh, he's made it really, really convincing that he doesn't exist. Uh, and he's made the, the arguments against his existence much more persuasive than the arguments for his existence. Um, maybe there is a God who has done these things. Uh, maybe it's kind of a weird sense of humor. I don't know, um, but 
for the time being, at least, uh, I'm, I'm confident to, to place my, my nickel on that side of the equation. Now, as to whether or not you want to be a free thinker, um, you know, being a free thinker is not necessarily being an atheist. Uh, as I understand, is the way that I think Bertrand Russell elucidated it. Being a free thinker is about how you believe, not just what you believe. Um, put very simply, if you believe that uh, tradition and authority are not sufficient reasons to believe things, right? So if your parents told you this is true, it doesn't make it so, not necessarily. If it's always been this way, if people have always done this thing, that doesn't necessarily make it true, or that doesn't, doesn't necessarily make it good. If you think that the reasons why it's good to believe things is because there's a lot of evidence, a lot of good evidence for that position, um, and if there's a lot of good reasoned arguments to support that position, then that's what being a free thinker is, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to believe a certain type of thing. You have to check the boxes of a certain set of beliefs. Free thinkers can believe all sorts of things. Um, it has been the case historically that the term free thinker was used as sort of a catch-all phrase or sort of a synonym for atheists or someone who rejected traditional religion. Um, that, that certainly has been the case historically, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we, that's the only way we can use the word now. Uh, and the, as I apply the word freethinker to myself, that's how I mean it. I mean that I form my beliefs not by appealing to tradition and, and authority and superstition, uh, but by appealing to reason and, and evidence only, wherever they take me. Uh, as for being a humanist, if you find yourself in a, in a situation where you're trying to put together a philosophy or a worldview without any gods, uh, especially if you're coming out of a traditional religion like uh, Christianity, Judaism, or, or Islam, uh, where a lot of emphasis is placed on, well, God says, therefore, uh, in, in terms of how you form your morality, uh, instead of doing that, right, if you, you can't really appeal to, well, God says, or the Bible says, or the Quran says, or whatever, then how do you determine what it means to live a good life, or treat people the right way, or treat yourself the right way? And, and so we come back to sort of what I was talking about before with regard to humanism, where do you value human life for its own sake? Right? And, and what is it about human life that makes it valuable, right? Because there's, um, you know, there, there's the, uh, the, the question of uh, euthanasia that, is, that we run into very often that is, I think, a bit of a dividing line uh, between where humanists are and where traditional religions are. Um, because for humanists, you know, if, if the value, if the, the, the central value is human life for its own sake, uh, hu and, and not just life, but quality of life, right? Human flourishing and thriving and, and enjoying life and being happy, right? So if you get to a position where your life is, is miserable and one of continual suffering, and you know, there's there's many ways where you could you could find yourself in this position. And if it's absolutely positively not possible to transcend that, uh, to to uh, to alleviate the suffering, let's say you have some sort of a terminal illness. This is a, a common scenario for people who are um, advocating for euthanasia, legal euthanasia. Uh, if there, you have a terminal illness that all this does is every day ratchet up the amount of suffering that you're experiencing and there is no possibility of, of any alleviation of that whatsoever in the future. Then ending your life, euthanasia, is actually a valuable thing and a moral thing uh, to, to attempt uh, as a humanist. Now, other religious traditions don't don't sort of fall in line with that. The Catholic Church is very famously opposed to euthanasia. 
Um, many Catholics view suffering as a good in and of itself, right? So traditional Catholic values uh, actually celebrate suffering. And many people don't realize that Mother Teresa, who is considered, well, she is now a Catholic saint, um, Saint Teresa, um, what, what she valued most in life was the suffering of others. And she felt that, uh, that helping others to suffer and, and being surrounded by their suffering would bring her closer to God because Jesus Christ suffered when he was crucified. And so this, this suffering was, was something that allowed them to um, achieve some sort of a higher spiritual level. Um, on, the, on the humanist side, that is horrifying and, and horrible and, and really immoral, right? So if you find yourself looking at a situation where someone is, uh, has a terminal illness and their every day <clears throat> is worse than the day before and there's absolutely no hope of any alleviation of that in the future, there's no medicine that exists now, there's no treatment that, that is on the horizon, and you look at that person and they're saying, I just want to end it all. I just want to close my eyes and end this life. I've had a good life, but now this is not good. I want to say goodbye to my friends and my family and close my eyes and, and be gone. And if, if you look at that situation, you feel empathy for that person. If you feel like you want to help that person, you think that they're, what they're trying to do and what they want for themselves is a good thing then you're probably a humanist. And so I would look, I would look more into that. Thank you, Dr. Sacrimore, for your time. Anytime. Thank you.